Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Hey everyone, it's Crown. I know my voice isn't back to how it was yet, but at least I can get out of bed now. Sorry for the short hiccup and hopefully I can resume my narrations now. Oh, and thank you for those who were patient and considerate when they found out I was sick. Thank you for the prayers and good wishes. I really appreciate always having you in my corner when I really need you. And yeah, for those who kept whining, crying and unsubscribing, well, you know who you are. I ain't gonna say no more. Anyways, let's start. Context I worked for a manufacturing facility an hour away from a major city in New Jersey. The participants, myself, fresh out of college, foreigner on a work visa. My colleague, who was also my lead, let's call him Mike, and my boss Jared, who was a total loser and a horrible boss. Story time. As I joined the department, I came to realize that Mike was a bit odd. I heard them publicly belittle Mexican people and say they are stealing our jobs, blah 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 nonsense. And I'm not Mexican, but I knew 100% that he was coming after me very shortly. He soon started joking with me, telling me that he feels I would really like Jeff Tommen because I would associate with Ahmed the terrorist, and some other really odd and insulting things about my culture. Keep in mind, when I joined the department, he was terrified because my skills were a lot better than his, something that was pointed out by executive management. I remained respectful and looked at him as a mentor. I avoided going to HR because I was on a work visa I was terrified of losing my status. I had no other options, transferring jobs was a messy situation. I would have to find an employer who was willing to sponsor me after investing in me. And I really wanted to stay in the country so I decided I was going to deal with it. All that meant was I was going home being angry in front of my significant other, something I truly regret. Then there was this one day. Ah, Mike refused to join a meeting because we were working on a project that I was assigned as a lead. He was integral to the project and when he didn't show up at the meeting, I respectfully went to his cubicle and asked him if he could please join us. His response was, I don't want to. Get out of my face. I asked again respectfully, to which he responded, Why don't you go back to your country? I said, Ah, what did you say? To which he doubled down by saying, I said, Why don't you go back to your country? Needless to say, I was right away in front of the vice president of HR, who tried to calm me down by saying, Mike used to be much worse. He's made so much progress. Please, don't let it get to you. Of course, me being the smarties I am, sorry dad. I said, okay, so you have a daughter, right? So if I was an abuser and used to abuse her once a week, but now I abuse her once a month, are you going to say that I was much worse and now I'm better, so I deserve compassion? You should have seen her face. Seriously, you should have seen her face. She was reeling. Of course, the point that I was trying to make was that some things are really black or white, without any gray areas. And guess what happened next? They called the therapist to have us both work in front of him so he can see if our interactions trigger each other's emotions. Unbelievable. A few weeks in, Mike was in his old self and made another xenophobic remark at me which I won't even mention so I went to my boss who by that time he said I was overreacting and he wanted nothing to do with this. I told him okay so today is Tuesday. If by Thursday morning you don't fire him, I'm quitting, but on my way out I'll be walking into the CEO's office and let him know what is going on. So pick carefully. If I quit, you are going to lose your job too. I'm going to make sure of that. He told me I was being a jerk because Mike has severe arthritis and I can't just fire him. I took the day off without letting him know and by Thursday morning they walked Mike out but I took the extra effort and let the CEO know and the vice president of HR along with my boss were also fired shortly after. I can't tell you how much I was shaking at the CEO's office. Oof. 
I had always been different growing up. I never quite fit in with the other kids. I was always the odd one out and I quickly became the target of bullies. It started with small things like teasing and name calling but it soon escalated to physical violence. I remember one time in particular when I was in 7th grade. I was walking home from school when a group of older kids came up to me and started pushing me around. They called me names and made fun of my clothes. And then they took it a step further. One of the boys pushed me to the ground and the others started kicking me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I tried to get up and run but they kept knocking me down. Eventually, they got bored and left me lying there in the dirt. After that, I became even more of a target. The police seemed to enjoy tormenting me and they did it every chance they got. I started skipping school and avoiding social situations altogether. I didn't want to be around people anymore, especially those who would hurt me. But one day, something inside me snapped. I was tired of living in fear and I was sick of being the victim. I decided that I needed to take matters into my own hand. I started attending self-defense classes at the local community center. And I must admit it was scary at first. But I quickly realized that I was stronger than I thought. I learned how to fight back and defend myself and I gained a newfound confidence. As I got older, I started working out regularly and focusing on my fitness. And I wanted to be in the best shape possible so that I could protect myself if I ever needed to. Years went by and I thought that I had left my bullying past behind me. But one night everything came flooding back. I was at a party with some friends when I saw them. The bullies. They were there, laughing and drinking, acting like nothing had ever happened. I felt a surge of anger and frustration bubble up inside me. I couldn't believe that they were still out there, living their lives as if they had never hurt me. I tried to ignore them but they kept staring at me, smirking and whispering to each other. I knew that something was brewing and I started to feel uneasy. Suddenly, one of the boys stumbled over to me and grabbed my arm. Hey, Emily. He slurred. Long time no see. I tried to pull away but he tightened his grip. Let go of me. I said, my voice shaking. He laughed. What are you going to do, huh? Cry and run away like you always do? I felt my anger rising and I knew that I had to do something. I took a deep breath and looked him straight in the eye. Actually, I said... I'm not going to run away this time. He laughed again, but I could see doubt in his eyes. He knew that something was different about me, and he sure didn't like it. Come on, guys, he said, turning to his friends. Let's get out of here. But I wasn't going to let them go that easily. I followed them out of the party and onto the street. You know what? I said, my voice steady this time. I am tired of being afraid of you. They turned around surprised. What are you talking about? One of them said, I'm talking about all the times you bullied me and all the times you made me feel like I wasn't good enough. I said, I'm done with being afraid of you. They looked at me incredulously, like they couldn't believe what I was saying. I could see the fear in their eyes and it made me feel powerful. You think you're so tough? One of them said, trying to sound brave. But we could still take you down. I smirked. You want to try? Before I knew it, they were coming at me fists flying, but I was ready for them. I had trained for years to defend myself and I was determined not to let them hurt me again. I must admit it wasn't the wisest decision to face a whole group of bullies at once and I won't say that I knocked them all out, but I really did a number on them considering the circumstances. While I left that night with a lot of bruises, they sure left with a lot worse. When it was over, they were lying on the ground bruised and battered. And I stood over them, feeling triumphant. If I ever see you again, I won't hesitate to do it again. I yelled at them as we separated. They scrambled to their feet and ran away, whimpering like scared little children. I watched them go, feeling a sense of satisfaction that I had never felt before. When I got home that night, I couldn't stop smiling. I had finally taken my revenge on the people who had made my life miserable for so long. And more than that, I had proven to myself that I was strong enough to stand up for myself. Over the next few days, word of what happened spread throughout the school. People were talking about how I had stood up to my bullies and defeated them. 
they started treating me with more respect and some of them even came up to me and apologized <laughs> for the way they had treated me in the past. I realized that I have become a kind of hero to the people who had also suffered from bullying. They saw me as someone who had fought back and won, and it gave them hope that they could do the same. But even more than that, I had finally found my own inner strengths. I no longer felt like a victim, but like someone who could stand up for herself and face any challenge that came her way. Looking back on it now, I realized that my revenge wasn't just about getting back at the people who had hurt me. It was about taking control of my own life and finding the power within myself to overcome my fears. And I know that no matter what happens in the future, I will always be able to stand up for myself and fight back against injustice. Because I'm Emily and I'm strong. Once I worked for this lady who owned a home health agency. And I was running it for her. At first it was not that bad. Margaret liked me and had me doing a lot of things that maybe went above my pay grades. But I didn't mind so much because I was learning a lot and it didn't involve any direct patient care. In 2014, when I first started, she had an LVN named Nina. She and I got along quite well and we were good work buddies. Sometimes patients would go to her office and she would shut the door. I don't know why she bothered to do that when it was obvious that she was admitting them. I wasn't exactly comfortable with that. Because you're supposed to be a registered nurse. But at least she was a nurse. After it turned into 2015 though, boss decided to put Nina out in the field. So I was the only one in the office. Shortly after that happened, boss called me on my prick and said, Hey, I need you to do me a favor. There is a patient in your office and I need you to take his vitals and write down all his meds and put him in the system. I said, Margaret, are you actually trying to get me to admit this guy? That is so far out of my scope of practice that I would lose my massage license and maybe go to jail. Oh, come on. You know you can do it. You have the knowledge and experience. I said you can try to flatter me all you want, but I'm not doing it. You are a registered nurse, why don't you do it so nobody gets in trouble with the state? She said, okay, I will give you a $50 bonus for every one of those you do. I said, really, $50? Wow, okay then, I'm in. I asked her how exactly I was to come up with diagnosis, though with no MD report. She said to just Google the meds and see what they are prescribed for and get the diagnosis from them. That is so illegal, I almost called my mom to ask her to put money in a commissary. So anyway, I did end up doing it that one time. But I knew that I had to outsmart her for ethics sake. Or I would have been stuck doing those for the rest of eternity and probably end up with legal problems for $50 a pop. I had to do something, but I wasn't sure what that was. Finally, I decided to deliberately make an error. The patient said that he was on gabapentin. I know what that is. And I also know why it's prescribed. It could be for multiple reasons, usually pain or anxiety. So I put down seizure disorder, the rarest problem it's prescribed for. When Margaret saw what I had put in, she started yelling at me. You know, that's for neuropathy, nerve pain. I said, well, I don't know that actually. There are a bunch of uses for gabapentin and seizure codes that pay more than neuropathy ones, don't they? According to the coding guide they do, I know how important it is for you to make you more money, right? And guess what? You know, I noticed that more than half of our patients are taking that. So I went back and changed all their diagnosis to say seizure disorder and exported all the corrected assignments to the state already. Aren't you proud of me? Of course, I did nothing of the sort. She literally lost her wig and screamed, Do you have any idea how many ADRs I'm going to get? It will take forever. I will have to have someone scan every last one of those records and submit them to Medicare. Meanwhile, they won't pay me. Ah. I shrugged and said, Well, I will probably estimate around 50 if the numbers add up. Okay, she screamed. That's it, I'll never ask you to do that ever again. And give me back that $50. Really? Oh no, are you sure? Oof, wow. I'm so sorry, I messed up. My bad. 
I know she saw me laughing at her as I walked away. There were cameras everywhere after all. So this story just happened last week and I realized it may be a good fit for this sub. So I go to a small liberal arts college. And one day last week we had a skills test in my analytical chemistry lab. Meaning that we had to perform a laboratory procedure in an allotted amount of time that we had done previously. Except this time graded on the results, accuracy for a good amount of points in the class. Needless to say, this is a very stressful thing to do, as it requires making very precise measurements. And for this specific lab counting individual drops one by one that could go into the 90s, over and over again. This is all to say that this particular day in lab required a lot of focus in counting, and mostly everyone was quiet and diligently yet stressfully going through the procedure. Mostly everyone. This is where the revenge victim comes in. Let's call her Hannah. Hannah is part of a group of three girls that are always incredibly and considerately loud in lab. This day in lab, the usual loudest one was working comparatively quietly like the rest of us, while Hannah and the third friend remained loud. Was Hannah very much in first place for volume? Not only was Hannah very rudely loud, but the substance of her loudness were topics that were very much inappropriate for a small lab with a professor nearby. Example, talking about going shopping for thongs with someone across the room. Hannah also tried to get friend number three to play music, which thankfully was shot down by the instructor. The result of all of this was an extremely frustrating lab experience for basically everyone who isn't part of the loud trio. As we all tried to count dozens of individual drops with an absurd level of inconsiderate background noise during a lab that is supposed to be quiet for everyone's ability to focus, the following day I had a psychology class that Hannah is also in, and she sits in a position where I'm able to see her laptop screen. I noticed that during the entire class she didn't pay attention whatsoever, switching between being on her phone and working on another assignment for a different class. Class that day was particularly more note-heavy than usual. After class, Hannah came up to me and asked if I could send her pictures of my notes from that day. As she said, she had another assignment she had forgotten about and had to do during class instead. I told her I would because I couldn't think of any good reason to tell her why I wouldn't. But I was still heavily irritated from my frustration the day before and therefore saw this as my chance for pity revenge. She could have pictures of my notes, but she was going to have to put in effort. Immediately after a while trying to figure out ways to make my notes harder to read, more than my already hard to read handwriting, I realized that I could take pictures of my notebook with the 0.5x magnification of my camera and then crop the photo down to make it look normal again but with far blurrier words. Eventually, I found the perfect distance for the camera in which the words weren't impossible to read but were certainly not easy by any measure. Just enough that she would have to zoom in on almost every individual word to figure out what was written. Afterwards, I sent her the pictures of my six pages of notes, apologized for my hard-to-read handwriting, and satisfyingly hoped that she would have just as hard of a time with them as I had listening to her in lab the day before. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.